name is Jay, and I guess you can smell my cock already. <laughs> Wait, what did you say? What? You smell it. Oh, no. A bit of background on my um, experience on baking, I guess. Um, I've been a baker for about five years before I went to tech. As I was actually working at bakeries and wow. like industry stuff. So, um, I'm not sure how many of you guys went to our, our 416 event with John, where <laughs> we, we bake edibles. Um, so, I guess this was a pretty highly requested talk about um, how to, like, so I guess I have, like, I have the ability to um, read a recipe and I can already tell how it tastes from just reading the um, ingredients. And I'm going to teach you guys how to do that in this, yeah. in this presentation. Yeah. 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 Never. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, like, for baking, right? There's, like, only a certain limited number of stuff you use. But, yeah. I, 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 like, there's spices and seasoning. That's, that is true. But I've tried to do seasons, like, on their own, so I know how oh. to apply it. Like, you kind of, like, do addition. So, all right, so the basis of baking. So baking, baking is a lot more of a food science than an art. You can't just like wing it and just like throw in stuff randomly because it has to come together in the oven in a certain way to form a bread or a baked good. So, yeah. so you gotta have to like know the basics. So the most like the most done um, study on baked goods is definitely like chocolate chip cookies. Like people have written like their whole dissertations on it. <laughs> <laughs> variations of chocolate chip cookies. Chocolate chip. So these are. Um, so this is an example of some person doing different variations of chocolate cookies using melted butter, brown sugar, granulated sugar, more flour, baking soda, all this stuff. Like, I actually don't necessarily, uh, necessarily agree with some of these um, conclusions because they're different from my experience, but I mean, someone did the, did the math. So same here, this is another, um, another study. All right, so when you're looking at a classic chocolate chip um, cookie recipe, right, these are some questions you should be asking. So like, why should I be using butter? Like, why not use oil? Why not use animal fat? Why not use like um, Crisco or uh, or like vegetable oil? So all right. So why both types of sugar? Like, why not use use like one type of one type of sugar? What if I swap out sh the sugar for like Mountain Dew or something? <laughs> <laughs> that actually did happen. Well, it's a long story. Okay. <laughs> Um, why not like full sweet chocolate chips? Why regular sweet chocolate, chocolate chips? And why? Um, why? So all chocolate chip cookie um, res uh, recipes say to turn the oven to either three hot between three hundred to three fifty degree um, degrees Fahrenheit. So why this um, temperature specifically? These are all questions to be like thinking about. All right. So these are the main ingredients in like. I'm gonna answer all of them. <laughs> oh, <laughs> So butter, this is like the, the first thing. So this is wheat butter, that's why it's green. All right, so it's made from shredded fresh milk. It actually gives you um, the moistness and that has like a nice savory flavor that uh, in, the, in your cookie, I guess. So and the replacement would be margarine or shortening. These are um, vegetable oil based and they actually do not add any flavor compared to butter. And they actually have the same melting temperatures. So they have, so your baked goods will have like the same spread. So you can, um, they're like one to one um, exchange. Um, oil substitute. So you can use um, oil as well um, to replace butter. But however, let's see, it won't, um, like butter also creates like a flakiness in dough because it affects like the, it's called leavening. When it mixes with the sugar, traps air and it um, gives you like a very nice fluffy texture. Oil does not do that. So you can also use cream cheese as a substitute for um, for um, butter, but you definitely want to have full fat replacement because the fat um, actually gives you the moistness of your of the um, baked good. So higher the fat content, the better tasting it is. <laughs> All right. Avocado substitute, which is what you guys are going to be tasting today. So you if you substitute half a cup of avocado for half a cup of butter, like you can tell like the calorie difference. Avocado is definitely the healthier substitute. However, um, like. Actually, I did not realize that, but it actually makes it very sticky, the dough. But um, it, it actually, you can, but make sure you don't do 100% avocado because it doesn't have the leavening property, properties of butter. So it won't make it fluffy. That's why I say like, ha ha. Okay. So creaming butter, this is the leavening process I was talking about. It's when you whip the cream and you, it captures um, air in the, in the mixture. 
So let's see. The air then becomes uh, like a leavening agent, which um, <coughs> causes the it, yeah makes the fluffy, fluffy, flaky, um, nice taste. All right. So yeah, let me think. Okay. Um, and side note is when you make cream cheese um, uh, cheesecake, you don't want to cream your mixture because you want it like heart attack inducing and as dense as possible. <laughs> so you just <laughs> push it against the bowl when you mix it. <laughs> So this is how um, uh, the butter and sugar mixture should look like. So, all right, now sugar. So this is what adds um, sh um, the sweetness to the baked goods, but also adds tenderness as well. So all granulated sugars are interchangeable. You can use like Splenda, cane sugar, palm sugar, coconut sugar, all of them, like one to one, it's fine. But it won't change the chemistry of the product, but it will definitely affect the flavor. So let's see, what's the difference between brown sugar and white sugar? Brown sugar is actually also known as raw sugar. It has 3% molasses because it's not purified. It has the same calorie value as white sugar, but has like larger, coarser crystals. And also, um, sugar doesn't really aspire because they don't promote microbial growth. Um, brown sugar becomes really, really hard if you leave it over time, so you just throw it in the microwave. And it does actually get flat though, like the um, really old sugar will have like a distinct taste. So why use both brown sugar and regular sugar in the recipe? The answer is, so these are cookies made with only white sugar, they don't rise at all. Because baking soda requires an acid to react to it, which causes the um, sugar to rise, or the cookies to rise. And in this case, the acid is brown sugar. So lacking brown sugar results in very dense and flat cookies. Like, these are like, just crisps. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, let's see, anything else? So let go. Okay, yeah, this is a little bit more sciencey stuff where it actually uh, absorbs moisture in the dough. So that's why you use all, if you use all brown sugar, it'll actually be like a bit too dry. All right, and it also has like a butterscotch flavor, which is a very overpowering in some cases. Okay, so honey and maple syrup as a substitute for sugar. So um, these are actually 18% water, so they actually will change the chemistry because it's more moisture now. And um, honey seems like a healthier alternative, but it actually denatures a bit when the temperature is too hot. So you have to lower the, um, lower the temperature of the recipe by about 25 degrees if you're substituting it. It's also more acidic, and um, when it burns, it actually has a really bitter aftertaste. So actually, I re I'd recommend using maple syrup as a replacement, which actually doesn't, uh, has like a higher, uh, does higher burning point, and I guess it tastes better too, and you guys are Canadian, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, powdered sugar as a replacement sugar. <laughs> It's not recommended because it actually has cornstarch and um, it's more used, it's more for, um, for, let's see, frosting. And um, it doesn't spread as easily, it's very powdery and yeah, it's not good for um, baked goods. But there are some cookies that actually use powdered sugar. Our unorthodox sweeteners, these are stuff I've actually used. Really <laughs> 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 Yeah, yeah. You, you um like melt them down into like syrup. Like, you, you're really desperate and you don't have any sugar. <laughs> um, so it's a viable alternative for, uh, for breads and cakes. Like, um, one instance, I was making banana bread and I actually ran out of, sh like, halfway ran out of sugar. So I actually used, like, Mountain Dew, which, uh, if you look at the nutrition facts, it's actually mostly orange juice. So it actually turned out, it tastes like exactly the same, but that's because banana is, like, a very overpowering flavor, which I'll get into much later. All right, so eggs. Eggs are like the hardest ingredient to replace in, uh, in, in baking. It's like magic. So they do at least like 10 things, actually. All right, uh, I'll skip that. Um, so egg yolk affects the texture of the baked good, brings, brings the water fats together for a creamier, smoother texture. Also provides moisture fats, helps emulsify the batter, which makes it like very uh, blended. Um, starches will also, um, it affects the structure of your cookie and the texture as well. And some more blurbs, science stuff. Um, so egg white. Um, the egg white actually steams the bread and um, provides moisture for the starch. So it's really good at trapping bubbles and retaining, um, retaining uh, water vapor or air. It also is responsible for this thing called the Mallard reaction, which um, when you have like barbecue chicken and you have like that, um, like that shiny coat on the skin, that, that's really sweet, that's, that's from the Mallard reaction, or like when you have a sesame bun, and it has that like crisp brown, um, brown thing on the end, that, makes, that like brings out like many different flavors. That's, um, that's from the egg white. So this is my personal recipe, like I was experimenting a lot for a vegan version of, uh, of eggs, 
And you, as, you re, uh, as you see, like there's like four different ingredients, oh and it's still an inferior substitute. So um, I think I ended up using ground flax, uh, flax seeds to, um, to because they contain high amounts of fat to mimic egg yolks, but they actually absorb moisture, um, unlike the regular egg, which um, provides moisture. So you have to compensate by adding in silken tofu, which um, mimics the egg white, and also um, and also the yogurt, which also provides moisture and holds everything together. The one the banana and applesauce is to um, counteract the drying from the ground seeds and also um, has a lot of starch for the texture. So like eggs are actually one of the very few things in cooking that um, actually become more solid when you heat them up. That's why um, it's very hard to mimic a lot of the properties that, um, that they provide. All right, so flour. <laughs> this is from like grinding all sorts of um, grains and stuff. And um, it actually becomes gluten, even though it's uh, gluten-free itself. Gluten is actually when flour absorbs moisture and forms these long croaking <coughs> chains that um, become like the starch from dough and stuff. So starches and flour break down sugar to provide food for yeast. Okay, I'll get into that later. Um, all right, so gelatinization occurs at 140 degrees Fahrenheit when the starches fully absorb the moisture to create the, uh, the vacuous structure baked in like the bread texture. And it's a super complicated process. All right, so differences between flour, I'm probably gonna go through this really fast. But basically, all purpose and restaurant blend are exactly the same. They're just marketed to different, um, like one's for restaurants and stuff, and the other one is for casual, uh, casual consumers. All right, so bread flour, it, this is, um, has high protein content. Uh, that cut off there. Um, let's see, whole wheat flour, it's like browner. They grind the whole thing. They grind, grind the whole, um, the whole yeah, wheat berry instead of just uh, um, instead of peeling it. Um, let's see, whole, white whole wheat flour is um, they use albino grains, so it's actually white in color and it's actually a bit different as well. Um, self rising flour has baking soda and salt, which is regular flour. Cake flour is used for um, like yeah, very fine, uh, <clears throat> very like. Cakey stuff. I don't know. <laughs> 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 All right, so it's pastry flour used for pastries. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one of the more flowers I was going to end with right now. <laughs> um, one thing to note is that um, in my experience, almond flour, tapioca flour, and coconut flour, they all expire really quickly, so I usually keep them in the fridge. But yeah, they actually taste pretty cool. Is cricket flour made of crickets? Yes, yes. it is. Is it from that other talk that was here? It actually has like a weird lumpy texture, which is like a bit off putting <laughs> compared does it also to. Crave oh. when it makes it moisture? Yeah, all flour does. Oh, thanks. Have you ever... All right, let's see. Baking soda. So, this is the, um, the thing that causes bread to rise and all the cookies to rise that are baking the oven right now. And it reacts with the acid in the, in the brown sugar to um, cause the cookie to rise. Um, it produces carbon dioxide, but on its own it has a metallic and bitter taste. However, when it um, reacts with the, big, the brown sugar, it actually neutralizes that taste. All right, so, so these are um, variations without, so not, no baking soda used. So you can tell like the, it, it gets more and more, yeah, more, uh, Rise yeah, risey. <laughs> Alright, so baking powder is actually just baking soda plus cornstarch and a weak acid, which is actually cream with harder in this case. It's um, double acting, which means like, wait a second, this is double acting right here. It releases bubbles when, it first, when it's first stirred into the mixture, then when it's heated in the oven, then it releases more carbon dioxide. All right, so yeast is the third leavening agent that's used. This is like never used for cookies because it has a very sour taste. But for like sourdough, um, like the whole um, the whole taste of the sourdough bread comes from like the yeast culture. And different yeast cultures have different flavors. Which like if you have been to the Essa Bodine, they're supposed to have like a very famous um, yeast culture from like the mother loaf that's been around for like 140 years. <laughs> 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 Um, all right, so he has some catalysts. Let's see. Cream and tartar is a uh, acidic byproduct from wine making, and it's used. It's commonly used for making um, like what's it called? Meringue. Meringue, yes. Where um, it stabilizes the egg whites, so it becomes like a solid structure. 
but it's not really using cookies, so I'll skip that. All right, milk. Milk isn't really using cookies either, but it's more for the um, it's more for the structure of the batter rather than the flavor of the flavor of the um, baked good. So you also want to use uh, full fat milk usually. The more fat, the better. That's how baking works. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why buttermilk is better than milk because <laughs> it's high fat. <laughs> and it's also acidic, so it reacts with baking soda even more to create more rice. All right, so can lactose intolerant people eat baked goods? Um, it depends on how lactose intolerant they are and how much they're eating. But butter has very little lactose, so if you're just using butter, no milk. But, and you can actually replace milk with soy milk. It works just as well, but not the fat thing, of course. All right, and salt um, doesn't really do much in cookies, but... It, it like kills yeast, and this is it's actually really important in sourdough bread, but I won't really get into that because I'm talking about cookies. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wrote down some stuff that it does. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right, salt and flavor. It actually it's like it turns up your taste buds when it when it um, when you taste salt. So uh, it, so your salt taste buds become more sensitive to other flavors that are there. So that's why you have like sea salt chocolate. It um, brings out the flavor of the chocolate. Okay, how, um, let's see, order of operations. This is kind of like basic mixing techniques. So this is like bad form when you put, when you put um, like the dry ingredient on top of your wet ingredients, which we did a lot yesterday. <laughs> but it, yeah, so like if you imagine this, right? This is very hard to mix without spilling. But if you put the wet ingredients on top, you can just like loop it up and down and it'll just mix. Um, so that was just, yeah, that's basically that. So temperature of butter. So, all right, so this is, um, if you use melted butter already, you would end up with this, and if you use uh, chilled butter, you end up with this. It actually affects the taste and the texture of the cookie. So you actually want to have a refrigerated butter. This is a better one. Because, let's see, you get like this fluffy mixture. This one has no air in it. The fluffy mixture um, has like air pockets, which makes for like puffier, nicer cookies. All right, crunchy versus chewy cookies. Actually, this is dependent on the temperature of the butter, not the recipe, usually. You can, um, if you want chewier cookies, the colder the butter is, by the time you bake it, the less the, the, less the cookie spreads in the oven. And this is um, overchilled but, um, over dough, which, is, which has got, become dehydrated. So when you, um, that's why we chill it in like sealed, um, sealed containers, like this. <laughs> oh, ghetto pro tip. So you have a, so you have like a, let's say you have like a hard cookie, right? Like a chip ahoy, crappy cookie. You can actually make it chewy by microwaving for 10 seconds. <laughs> actually, oh, oh, we're going to skip over that. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> There's a lot of like stuff that's skipping over. That, that Alright, this is like ghetto because they actually do that in the industry. <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh, this cookie's like a little bit stale, let's microwave it. Now it's good. We're posting these slides, right? Yeah, yeah, they're out there. Yeah. They're out there. yeah. I'm going over the, these pretty fast because there's like 70 slides. <laughs> <laughs> so chocolate chips. So there's always like, why do you use semi-sweet versus regular? So regular is actually milk chocolate, which contains actually less cocoa and more milk and sugar than semi-sweet. The flavor tends to be sweeter, but like milder, which means like it gets lost with the cookie flavor. So it's good for melting down and like adding the topping, but um, it's not really preferred for cookies. Semi-sweet has like, it's just like a really strong cocoa flavor. It's not as strong as dark chocolate, but it, um, I guess it's what's kind of developed for cookies, that's why. Semi-sweet is usually what you use. All right, so this is what happens after you finish <laughs> making the cookie and putting it in the oven. So the dough spreads like what, at 92 degrees Fahrenheit, that's when all the butter um, should, should be melted. And this is when the cookie like starts having that, um, spreading out and having that cookie shape. And all right, after that, after it spreads, the edges set and the edges become like crunchy. So um, let's see, because all right, it's kind of let's, so you have so you have your like um, your your hot your hot um, uh, tray, right? So the <clears throat> the cookie starts out. The bottom part's always the hottest. So um, it becomes solid. Then the part will cut. Um, then the next li the li liquid part on top of it would kind of spill over and then um, touch the tray as well. And then it sort of like um, moves outward like that. And at a certain point, the ed all the edges are set, and the shape of the cookie is now like permanent. So that's when, um, yeah, that, that's how like the shape happens, I guess. So um, then the eggs cook at 144 degrees Fahrenheit. Once they get hot enough, they, um, uh, let's see, 
the cookie structure, I guess, forms, and the eggs like hold everything together. And at uh, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, the oh shit, why does it say butter melts? Huh, I'm not sure. Okay, the cookie structure loosens and frees up water, which dissolves the baking soda, reacts with the acid, and causes it to rise. All right. Um, so then the malleable reaction happens at 310 degrees Fahrenheit. The proteins for the flour and eggs uh, brown, and the sugar coating flavor aroma components all um, like this is where most of the flavors come out. So and although caramel um, sugar caramelizes at 350 degrees Fahrenheit, so most of like the cookies in the oven right now they're at like 300 degrees Fahrenheit. That's like the recipe uses 300 degrees Fahrenheit as the um, as the max heat. However, the oven isn't actually like uniform in heating. There are areas that are, are going to be a lot hotter, like around to like up to like 380, where and there's going to be places that are like at three, um, 250, it's just uneven heating. So um, as a result, you do have areas where the sugar caramelizes at 300 degrees Fahrenheit, and it causes it to um, usually around the edges. So that's why you have like nice crunchy edges, and also like the cracks too of the cookie. All right, so as the um, cookies out of the oven, then it um, kind of settles and everything starts. Um, so it's like you shouldn't eat the uh, cookie right after you take out of the oven. You probably burn yourself, but also because um, it's still cooking. And all right, so there's a video here that actually explains all this, which is pretty cool. All right, so this is where it becomes more of an art than a science. Is when um, you have all these factors that you can't control for, uh, account for, and you have to, um, and they all do affect the um, the baking of your of your um, good. So things like oven oven variations, like. Uh, um, I had to change the recipe for these cookies to normally it's nine minutes, split nine minutes, but this time it, it's probably around ten to eleven minutes, split eleven minutes, just because the oven's smaller and less industrial. Um, and there's also like variations of egg size. There's also all kinds of stuff, and you kind of have to have to have like a normal feel for it. When you make the recipe enough times, you can tell like what um, how it's supposed to feel and look like. And so you have to kind of use your experience and like artistic license to, uh, to deal with these variations. All right, so this is the recipe you're about to eat. <laughs> and uh, I guess one of the questions would be, why don't you just swap out everything? Like, why not use butter substitute, brown sugar substitute, sugar substitute, egg substitute, uh, to substitute everything? And I guess you could. So this is a bit blurb on, on taste theory. Like, so why are there so few ingredients in this um, recipe? The chocolate chip cookies are supposed to be only have like a few flavors, and the cookies supposed to complement those flavors and um, and bring those out. So you know exactly what you're uh, tasting. So let's assume you change like um, butter to avocado, um, Mountain Dew. You also use Jolly Ranchers. You also use regular sugar. You use my egg substitute. You use like uh, yeah uh, three types of flour. And like six types of chocolate chips, like it would still probably taste good. You just probably wouldn't know like what flavor you're eating at any point in time when you're eating the cookie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So other things that affect taste. So taste is actually very um, psychological. So like um, how good someone is describing to you just how something tastes will actually affect that. Like the temperature, like you know, cold beer versus warm beer. Warm beer is like atrocious, but. <laughs> Um, so color. So if you have like two identical cookies, one's like completely tie-dyed, like blue color, and versus one that looks like how you expect it to look, the the one that ex you expect it to look will, is actually going to taste better. And let's see environment, whether um, like the restaurant actually the location in which you eat food um, also affects how how it tastes. Um, how you eat it, like whether you're actually paying attention to the taste or you're just like chugging it, eating it. All right. So and there's also yeah the height. <laughs> All right, so this is actually a really interesting study. So um, Pepsi beats Coke in every single taste test, but Coke outsells Pepsi by like 70 to 30 percent. This is the reason why is um, because people expect Coke to taste better. So when they run a brain scan of people drinking Coke, areas in the brain that are um, for nostalgia actually light up. So they're actually like it's bringing back memories of like good times. Alright, so think of taste kind of like a play TV show, right? So you have certain flavors at certain times they're hitting at different um, it's kind of like a stage. Like um, uh, early flavor would hit first and then it 
does this thing on the stage, and then another one will either like block it out or um, come in. So this is like uh, my MS Paint. So this is the actual cookie flavor. It's actually a pretty mild flavor, and it's pretty constant throughout the whole thing. The brown sugar. Um, let's see. Yeah, the brown sugar has that little bit of a caramel taste that kick, that uh, happens like right after the chocolate flavor. The chocolate flavor is obviously the strongest, but it's also one of the briefest tastes. And the butter flavor is very subtle, and it happens like right before the end. So having too many flavors makes it difficult to control what you're tasting and what you should focus on when you're eating. All right, edible day. So this is a bit. <laughs> so we have a very very overpowering um, aftertaste that kicks in like right after two seconds. So like if you have chocolate and weed, it'll probably taste chocolate, and then you taste like all weed, and then the <laughs> sauce. So like very poor form I, I feel is when you eat edibles that have like that just taste like weed, because most uh, I guess there's some stoners who really like the taste of weed, but to the casual consumer like. <laughs> <laughs> Did you make these granola muffins yesterday? It was oh, really good. You guys should try it. Yeah, we winged them too. <laughs> but it's actually really interesting. So the granola muffins have very, very little weed in them, but you can still taste it when, you, when you're eating it. Yes. And it's like <laughs> ridiculously <laughs> low amounts. So that, that, yes. that should give you an example of like how strong weed is. But the nice thing, so like these are the, my go-to replacements for covering up weed flavor. Coconut banana. So the better they, co they, cover, they cover up the flavor, the more weed you can put in. So. <laughs> so you can get like some really, really strong stuff. And then you wouldn't even know that it's edible. Now you know why we call them baking bad. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And I think that's it. Alright, so questions? Why was there only one slide on your weed? This part was kind of like thrown in, huh? Would you share your weed cookie recipes? Um, it's actually basically so weed um, is THC is very fat soluble, right? So it actually gets mixed into the butter. So you can use this exact um, recipe, but then you where's the butter? Use weed butter. Yeah, you use weed butter instead. Here, there, like that. So you just like substitute one to one. That's about it. However, like this does have a very soft flavor, so you do have to like. Um, I would I would actually uh, advise you to use like half weed, half coconut oil, or coconut uh, coconut butter, because that would actually like cancel taste okay. Wait, do you make this or you eat butter? Which one? The weed butter. Oh, I used to make it in college. It's it's like very very tedious, very tedious. So there's like a huge process where you take the weed, you put it on a tray, you bake it at um 350 degrees, I think no 400 degrees Fahrenheit, where it actually um, awakens the weed. So it becomes, instead of giving you like a regular high, uh, like uh, smoking, it actually gives you a hallucinogenic high, which is actually like a lot more intense and strong. <laughs> so when you, when you, you bake weed, like the weed before, and then you, then you take the weed, and then you put it into, uh, you, you strain it with butter, and then um, you simmer it until, until like um, the butter has absorbed all the THC, and you strain out the, the, the chunks of the crab. So the, yeah. The, it's like a really, really complicated process. It makes your whole kitchen smell like weed. It takes like three hours. So, I have my butter. What? Oh, there's a lot of um, medical, um, like, dispensaries. <laughs> yeah, dispensaries that, that sell it. And they also have, like, exactly how much um, weed is um, in each, um, like, ounce. And the um, strengths are different. Yeah, the strengths are very different. Does these sell it? These? Yes, they do. Oh, and you should talk about how it, like, changes the dose activity. Oh yeah, sure. Like, um, all right. So, okay. okay. All right. So, um, weed is actually very oily, especially if you um, buy it from buy it from the um, buy it from uh, dispensary. Like, uh, compared to this, you'll probably end up with something like uh, when you mix up mix the um, when you let's see mix uh, where is it? Butter plus sugar. Oh, anyways, but yeah, when you cream the butter, you're going to end up with this no matter what. Um, when you cream the um, weed butter with this, so in order to compensate for that, you actually um, like either add more, um, you add more flour, or for um, let's see, um, or you add more of a drying agent to co uh, compensate. Or you bake it for long. Yeah. Or you lower the temperature and bake it for longer. Yes, right. So what was more? Yeah. Go ahead. Have you ever seen the baking anime? Like uh, the one with the warm hands. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that like? 
any realistic. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't think no. I don't think Warm Hands would do much. The whole point of his his backstory is that he like um he he acts as a catalyst for wheat yeast or wheat uh, yeast. So I guess it um, proofs faster in his hands or something. But honestly, there's these things called proofers, which um, in in street. It's basically a, hum a humidifier room where you just leave the bread in there for like a few hours and it comes out like six times bigger. Then you bake it. So, so I mean, you don't need to work out to. Like, yeah, you, you, don't, you don't need <laughs> special abilities to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, do you only bake cookies or do you like to bake other pastries as well? Um, What's your favorite thing to bake? Banana bread. Banana bread. Oh, because oh my God. You, can, you can have so much marijuana in the banana bread. <laughs> <laughs> No joke, we're back for like three days when, the, when we first had oh oh it. No. What, about, what about like croissants? Can you make like weed croissants? Yes, you can. Uh, <laughs> croissants, the problem with croissants, they have a very subtle taste. Oh. Like, um, so oh, so weed, weed flavor is, is very overpowering. So you have to find something like either coconut. So you I'll end up with like very strong coconut croissant or something like that. To help the guys live out. What about chocolate? Go ahead. So like, in baking a week, is it any, as it, like, Baked edibles are the best way to consume weed? I believe so. <laughs> 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 yeah. I don't know. We're going to create a decision. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Alright, so we're going to go back to the next one. Yeah. 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 You come across a lot of the newer recipes. Um, short of actually experimenting and trying them, mm -hmm. what kind of resources can you use? Are there literature? Is there like art journals for this? Or are there um, talk to about the the like you're trying to like figure out how a recipe tastes before you. Um, let's see. Besides um, exper uh, experimenting with it, right? Um, well, like for example, I baked banana bread so many times that when I see a banana bread recipe, I can already tell like, oh, it's going to be either too wet or too dry or something because I've just done it so many times. I know exactly how each ingredient affects it, um, but. See, I think if you understand, like if you if you understand how um, all the ingredients are go coming together in the in the baked good, then you can uh, kind of like infer based on um, the ingredients, like how it's going to taste and the texture of how it's going to be. So it sounds like you have a very holistic kind of tried and true. I've done this before. This is what it feels like. Uh -huh. There's also I think views that are more mechanistic. Like you add this and add this to this and add to that. No, no, I definitely agree with that. Like if you, like in these slides, I kind of. Teach you like how each um, ingredient interacts with other ingredients to affect the flavor and stuff. But um, I guess um, once you have like the basic understanding of that, then you can kind of extrapolate like how other things taste. So yeah. is cooking a science or an art? I think it's both. That's what I said. Oh, okay. <laughs> I started, I'm, trying, I'm definitely approaching this from the scientific scientific perspective because um, like I'm, I'm giving you kind of like absolutes like how each thing affects each thing. Yes. Like, uh, so the, this is a very scientific approach. However, like I said, um, there's a lot of factors that you can't, you can't account for, <laughs> like variations. Yeah. That you have to kind of like use your um, like own judge, judgment. yeah, your own judgment on how it's supposed to look versus how it looks right now. Go ahead. How would you describe your touch? My touch. The more I touch the bread, it means the less well equipped I am. If if I had like a standing mixer, if I had like a whole setup, I wouldn't even touch it. I would just like um, just pour different ingredients in and just mix have everything mix itself. What about the sun hands? So when we get to the go ahead. Actually, the ones I'm making right now. Um, <laughs> oh, I, sold this, I sold this recipe I, I, from a gourmet cookie, a gourmet cookie store. So I literally like, um, like the, the first the first week. Yeah, the first week I uh, I went to I, I started working there. I'm like, oh my god, these are so good. I went and just like memorized every single recipe, violated all my NDAs, <laughs> <laughs> all of them. Down. So yeah, that's, that was like the best thing that ever came from that place. Yeah. Yeah. Are you yes. gonna cover shop now? No, probably not. I don't know. I'm thinking about it. <laughs> They'll never find out. Just that no cookie. <laughs> I'm not sure. 